All right, great. Well, we are about two minutes in. Um, I know that we have a lot of information to get through today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, my name is Elizabeth Lamb. I'm the Partnerships Manager for Breaking the Glass. Breaking the Glass is a women's career development initiative um, within the ESG department of S3. Um, so our mission is to help um, attract, retain, and promote talent within all of STEM industries. And we do this by providing co-hosted events and partnerships with STEM companies and STEM communities. Um, today, we are doing this event in partnership with IBM Central Texas ERG. This is our third um, event with them. They've been wonderful hosts throughout the years, and we're so excited to be back. Um, you know, we do a lot of programming, um, you know, around these career development topics as well. So if you are part of an organization that is looking for programming, co-host, or you're someone who is a speaker that is interested in sharing about their path to their STEM career, um, their own advice for career development topics, or also diversity inclusion too, we would love for you to get more involved. Um, I'm gonna be dropping some resources in the chat. You can add me on LinkedIn. You can subscribe to Breaking the Glass as well, and we can start the conversation from there. Um, a few housekeeping things before we get started by passing the mic over to our moderator, Ben Williams, is that if you have just any comments, fun shout outs you wanna include, please put that in the chat panel. Um, if you have any questions, there will be a Q&A portion at the end of the session. Be sure to put that in the Q&A box. That's the best place for those questions to get viewed and answered live as well. The session's being recorded, so um, we'll also be sharing that out. So if you have any colleagues or team members that, you know, miss this session, but, you know, would take some good pieces of advice from this as well, you'll be able to pass the session on forward to them. So without further ado, um, I'm going to pass the mic over to Ben Williams. I'll be on mic and off camera for the rest of the session, but I'll see you at the end. Um, and yeah, we might have one more speaker joining us in a few minutes, but um, yeah, we're flexible and we're excited to see where uh, the next hour goes. All right, over to you, Ben. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you everyone else for joining us today in this webinar. My name is Ben Williams and I'm a Salesforce recruitment for Computer Futures. What we do there is we do hire as well as consult talents across the nation in order to not only help them get a job if needed, but just to kind of advise proper career paths, if that makes sense. Going on, we would like to introduce Marie, Mary Palmer, as well as Divya, and as mentioned, Melissa Shepard. Awesome, do you want me to take it away? Oh, yes, please. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Mary Palmer, and I currently work at Austin Energy as an environmental program coordinator. So I design and implement programs to foster the adoption of renewable energy. Um, my career path has not been linear. <laughs> Prior to Austin Energy, I, I spent seven years in the nonprofit sector um, where I was at a community development financial institution first, followed by the League of Women Voters and a few other groups that focused a lot on civic engagement and public policy. Um, and then finally worked in Fiji, where I led the construction planning, vendor coordination, um, and installation of rainwater harvesting systems to provide potable water for the locals. So it has been a maze and I'm very happy to be here and I'm really hoping to be able to share some information that hopefully will be helpful to you. Hi everyone, I'm Divya Narahari. Uh, I work for IBM as a software engineer and good news is I just got promoted to senior software engineer this morning. Uh, so very happy today. Um, and prior to IBM, uh, I've also worked for New York State Mesonet, s and Global and Commerce Hub. I'm also a certified uh, yoga and meditation teacher. Uh, I'm looking forward to share a lot of things about self-advocacy and career advocacy. Thank you. Hey, Melissa, are you here with us? 
All right, everyone. I think uh, what Melissa is going to do is, as mentioned, she may be joining a little bit later. And we would like to just start off by asking a few questions to the panel, seeing if they could give advice on everybody on how to pretty much self-advocate themselves in a professional manner when it comes to career growth. So I would like to open up this question initially to Mary. Uh, we know that, of course, sometimes people are looking for a career change. It usually comes across when people aren't as happy as they could be in their current situation. Mm -hmm. So usually whenever things need to be changed, uh, we would have to induce certain habits. So out of curiosity, you know, what type of habits would you want to build? How would you build these habits in order to promote self-advocacy and personal development so that whenever the next opportunity does come along, um, you are best prepared? That's a great question. Um, I think my answer has two parts, right? I really do feel like self-care, awareness, professional development, however you want to phrase that, really does come from um, knowing yourself and really taking care of yourself and putting yourself first, right? So part of the, the first part of that is that um, I really like to nurture myself and really focus on self-reflection time. I read a lot of books. Um, my friends often tease me about being real cheesy, but I'm all about, you know, making vision boards and, and reading about self-help and uh, really, you know, getting to know what my values are, because I really do feel like that that ethos of uh, being able to advocate for yourself comes from that core first, right? And then after that, <clears throat> excuse me, it kind of, you, you, you know, I'm like a a chronic wandering eye when it comes to jobs, right? I'm always looking at new jobs all the time. And so I'll look at, at, at jobs that I aspire to have and be like, okay, what skill sets and knowledge do they need? Like what I need to be able to, to qualify for that. And so I'll, I'll learn, you know, and it's not always formal education. Sometimes it's YouTube videos or free online classes. And, um, you know, it can be anywhere from learning Excel to, or, or, um, you know, any other programming language to something more like the principles of circular economy, right? So it's just about like really trying to, to, to develop yourself first and then just look and dream to the future and then and really act on those things in the present, right? Yeah. Out of curiosity, you know, whenever you mentioned all these tools, books, as opposed to like learning via YouTube videos and uh, having a vision board, if you will, what would you say, um, it could be, it could be a number, but what would you say has been like the number one motivating factor? Not only that, but the one that has affected you the most that you know of. And then also about how many times a day, how many minutes or how often would you practice those habits? I think um, because so much of my job uses the more structured side of my brain, for me, the most effective is to use art or music or something that's the opposite side of my brain. So the visualizing with the board um, is very helpful. It's like, even just from thinking of like, what's my office going to look like and things like that. And um, I try to do that, um, I would say anywhere between half an hour to an hour a day, you know, and, and usually if it's gonna be an hour, I'll try to split it up because I do like reading. I'm, I'm all about biographies, right? I wanna know, what did this successful person do, right? Um, so yeah, I, I would say an hour a day is, is a, a good amount of time. Um, and the time of day, I mean, really just depends on people. Like some people like to wake up right away and do that. I am not that person. Um, I like to do it before I go to bed so that I kind of like go off into the dream space and yeah. wake up fresh, but yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, Divya, I know that you mentioned that you were a yoga instructor and you taught. It, has that played a part in kind of like building a habit towards personal development in ways you necessarily didn't think it would? Yes, um, I would say 100% it did help uh, because the first uh, main thing in advocating yourself is under understanding your own self, being self-aware about uh, here we are talking about career. So one should be aware of what their aspirations are. And only when you're aware of what you want to be in your career, where you want to go in your career is, um, is only going to help you, um, you know, let other people know 
that uh, that you want to be in a certain position, you want a new project, or you want to take up an initiative at a work or whatever it is in your career. Um, I think yoga and meditation definitely helps. Um, also journaling helps. Uh, there are a lot of worksheets on uh, Google, like advocacy or self-awareness worksheets you could Google, but some basic questions that I would like to post, tell here are to think about what are your three greatest strengths? What are the things you, uh, your favorite things uh, to do regarding your career? What were your recent, uh, three recent successes, big or small? And why do you think you were successful in that three successes, right? Or what could you have done differently with those um, things or uh, recent successes? So taking up these questions and really journaling about it regularly will bring in a lot of inner thoughts and it will make yourself aware right so i think the first thing when you uh, before you put uh, yourself in the radar where is to be aware of your own self definitely um i know that some people have a journal where it's just completely blank uh, other people will have journals that per se would prompt them on certain questions um, they do have like a sort of structure to them out of curiosity, have there been any certain journals or any certain brands that you personally recommend that you can speak highly of? Um, I've personally tried a lot of things on Amazon and things that I've been drawn through Instagram and stuff, but I've finally stuck onto a, you know, just a notebook. Oh. Just a notebook. Find your questions, write it there. And... Uh, it might not be a more of a formal process, but just go on a Sunday, get some coffee in a nice coffee shop, get some alone time and think about it. That's it. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Says, I know it's very easy for anybody to just kind of like get stuck or feel in a rut. So they're probably, everybody can, right? It's very easy for any one of us to in a sense, in essentially feel lost at some point. Um, and so with that in mind, I know like, a lot of people do say that whenever we get in a comfortable position, once, once we stay in a comfort zone, it can be. It can be difficult to move forward or just even grow. Um, so another question to, to Mary is, you know, whenever these times do come, whenever there's a lot of difficulty or you feel yourself getting comfortable, how have you personally been able to get yourself out of that rut in order to pretty much set yourself up for new challenges? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it goes back to what bo bo both Divya and I were saying earlier is that it really does start with the self, right? So like cultivating that habit for me, ha it usually begins with something that's not at all related to work. So it'll be something like trying a new exercise or doing like five extra push-ups a day or like, you know, if someone's really introvert to get out, you know, getting out of their comfort zone might be like talking to a stranger, right? It's just like building that habit of being like, okay, I'm going to do something a little bit harder than I normally do. Um, and then, and then it kind of just winds up translating into to work. And so um, I usually find myself volunteering. That's usually my way to get out of my comfort zone because it's not too much of a commitment. Like I'm not getting a new job but I am trying something new and I, I try to do something that's completely unrelated. So we have a line worker rodeo. Um, sounds weird, but it is a thing at the utility. Um, and so I volunteer for that because it's like, you know, this is a way to learn, meet people, to learn more about the, the wires and transmission side of my, my job and, and to do something that I wouldn't normally do on a normal basis. So yeah, I would say like, Again, it goes back to just cultivating that habit on your own, right? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to ask too, what was the last time that you have felt kind of stuck or in a rut? Um, what was the most recent experience that you've had with that and how did you overcome mm, it? That's a great question. I think most recent, probably a couple years ago, um, it was about before I had been promoted to to the, co the coordinator position where I am now. I was, I was an associate and 
And it just had gotten to a point where it was very repetitive, right? I was definitely making a lot of net friends and networking and really supporting the programs, but I didn't really feel like um, I was able to really be the architect of, of, the, of the programs the, the way I wanted to, right? And so um, I just kind of reached out to various groups, you know, I started doing Toastmasters, I started uh, I voiced what I was thinking about to my boss. I kind of just created things without being prompted. So like, even though I wasn't necessarily charged with creating the business case for the next thing, I would just create one and be like, what do you think about this one? What, what if we took the program in this direction and here's the PowerPoint presentation and here are the speaking points and here's the data. And they kind of, after a while, were just like, you know, maybe you should do this, you know? So sometimes it's just giving yourself the homework, even though it's, more work, but like, it, it's just doing it without being asked, you know? <laughs> so that helped me. Yeah, definitely. Trying out new things can lead into paths, um, whether that be yoga, whether that be journaling or mm -hmm. just setting up a presentation, it can lead to opportunities that we might not necessarily know of, but then come to us um, whenever the opportunity makes sense to pursue as well at as, well as open. Um, out of curiosity, Divya, now, would like to ask to you as well, when was the last time that you yourself has had kind of like a, a rut or just you felt yourself getting way too comfortable? Um, and I'm curious, you know, how, how did you overcome that yourself as well? Yeah, I was in that state when COVID started. Mm -hmm. so I was, I'm a software engineer. I get requirements. I develop code, push it. It's released. The feature is there. Users are using it. So this was a cycle I was into and I was doing the same kind of projects again and again. And I was like, is this what I really want to do? Do I really like IBM? Should I move out? Should I stay? Should I move to another team? Um, but I didn't know. I, was, I felt like I was in a, in a dark room. I didn't know. So I really, uh, that's when I approached a person to be my mentor and she opened the possibilities up for me. So she said one thing that really struck me that the opportunities are right in front of you. So look into your team. Is there an opportunity for anything new to do in your team? Take up that initiative and that will help you in your career advancement. If you don't find anything in your team, look in within your organization, and if not within your organization, maybe in another organization, of course, for that networking is needed and all that. But every time an opportunity is right in front of you to whatever you are planning to aspire for. So that really struck me. And uh, that's the time I was really uh, looking for opportunities around me. And I found that one of the process ways we Im implement um the way we project manage our project was very naive and i wanted to improve that process for uh, so i approached my manager and proposed the solution that this is how we are doing a certain thing and i would like to do in another thing and these are the advantages these are the disadvantages a process change is a big mindset change for the team so i need your help to do that so my manager really liked the idea and always your management likes solution givers than solution seekers because they want solutions, right? So after I did that and it's been a year, my team is in a better shape now managing our product projects and delivering it by in time. So I, I, the only advice I can give is the opportunity is right in front of you. It's just that you have to be self-aware and have your eyes wide open. For it. Yeah, Divya, I love that. And I, I feel like sometimes when people are thinking about personal advocacy, they kind of think of just like, oh, let me just speak about something. And I love that it's like, no, you got to mm -hmm. come up with solutions and do something. <laughs> Yeah, what I wanted to expand upon is the fact that you did mention having a mentor, seeking out a mentor. Um, you know, a lot of people, they, they do, they advocate for finding a mentor as well as they just hear about it. Um, how did you go about 
finding what mentor you would work best with? And number two, um, how has that relationship been proven, I guess, beneficial since then? Yeah, I um, chose a mentor based on where I want to be, where, to whom I look up to, how did they get there? So I approached a person who, who I look up to and asked for some time. And um, it's, it's a very, it, um, I think having a mentor is really very important because they open up so many possibilities. They were in your situation one long time ago and they know what that situation is like. And how did they get out of there? So uh, that is really good. And it's very important that you keep, um, you regularly meet your mentor, right? Um, and your mentor could also introduce to other things, other possibilities. And if you, your mentor already knows you, might tell what are your strengths too, right? So my mentor already knew me uh, and she told, Divya, your organizing and your communicating skills are very good. So why don't you take up opportunity in so and so thing? Uh, let me introduce you to X, Y, Z. And then that person op opened up another possibility for me. So it's like a chain reaction, I should say. Awesome. Um, I'm curious, Mary, do you, by chance, do you have any mentors yourself that you personally keep in touch with? Uh, if so, how have they helped you? I feel like, yeah, I definitely have mentors. I, um, in the beginning, it was just sort of accidental, if you will. It was like, kind of like, I just kind of would latch on to somebody and then just follow them around and harass them to have lunch and ask a bunch of questions. Um, but they've, they've been, I, I definitely have a couple women in my life that I reach out to very regularly. And um, they're awesome just because they're able to ask really insightful questions, right? And, and really able to step back way, you know, thousands of feet backwards and be like, you know, just, just really give you a different perspective. And it's also nice because they, they kind of become your cheerleader, you know, they're, they're able, you know, that's somebody who's going to be always in your corner and, and that's really nice, you know, to have. So for sure, I, I lean on mentors um, and talk to them probably, I would say once a month. Mm. I want to add something here. Um, these days, most workplaces have these mentorship program. I'm fortunate that I'm at IBM and IBM has a very good mentorship program. Uh, so that way we know who are open to be a mentor and you can reach out to them. Or sometimes they also call them as coaches. So um, yeah, look out uh, for such mentorship programs in your organization or outside your organization. Yeah, definitely. So it kind of makes sense to just ask the question, number one, if the company that you currently work at has a mentorship program, and then number two, if if not, then finding people that you kind of see yourself wanting to model after reaching out to them and asking them for their mentorship, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Awesome. I um, wanted to ask an, another thing. Well, it seems like the tools and actions has gone from trying out new events, you know, doing presentations and finding solutions in the company, or it could be along the lines of journaling where you're asking yourself these tough questions, even finding a mentor. Another thing is, well, whenever any of us come into a rut or just kind of finding ourselves in a cycle, if that makes sense, um, how, what is the best way to tell that and communicate that to support systems such as families, such as friends, um, even such as our work colleagues, because even if we feel it ourselves, it could affect our relationships and our behaviors around them as well. So what are some ways for us to communicate that to the people around us? Divya, would you like to start off by suggesting a few ways or a few, yeah, just maybe some steps in order to maybe not be as, I would say, scared of letting those people know how we're feeling during those times and that we need their support? Yes. Um, firstly, I would say if you aspire for something, I know there is a lot of fear 
will we even be there what if i fail what if i don't succeed what if i fail and people laugh at me right but i think there is a lot of courage and confidence that comes out when you put it out into the world that i want to be this i want to be maybe for example i should say uh, i want to be a senior software engineer and when you say this to your family uh, or your for example maybe to your team your manager your manager knows that you're aspiring for something that's greater than what you are at present right so that opens up the possibility for you so i believe in telling it openly um and when you're sharing with it with your family that this is your goal for this year and i'm looking for opportunities in this particular area um set the expectations from your family that what you're expecting from them during this time what kind of support system you do you want and are they willing to extend that support and if they are not willing to extend that support it's fine but having that conversation is very important right maybe to take this co extra course i need to spend an extra hour in the evening so i might be late for the dinner i will not be able to make dinner tonight or something like that and you can maybe your family will extend help or if they don't extend help maybe meal prep right so you can always find solutions small solutions around that but i think communication is the first thing uh, let your family know let your workplace know that you want to be so and so so i'm working and looking for opportunities for this i need help i think that's good Definitely. So it all starts with having just that tough conversation or maybe just a simple conversation, if you will, mm -hmm. just to go based off of an answer, maybe just kind of the path ahead of us that we can all exercise after just stating our concerns, stating our problems, right? Mary, has there been a time where, you know, you have didn't, didn't get the support that you needed after communicating? Um, and then what did you do afterwards? How did you still persevere and move on even after communicating that you needed support if that has ever happened to you? So I actually have been very fortunate to have very supportive management teams. And um, <clears throat> so when I have gone to them to let them know, you know, that something's going on and I'm facing a situation, I need some support. Um, I almost always got the response that they were willing to help immediately. Um, occasionally, though, it would take them a little time to kind of think about it, right? They would have to kind of process the information and then maybe come back to me. So it wasn't always in that moment that I knew I was going to get their support. And so I guess in that time, I kind of would um, give it a little bit of space, you know, give it some space um, and then approach them again. <laughs> but but this time, maybe making it a little bit more, more um, solution oriented, right? Because I think sometimes in the time I wasn't successful, I pretty much was just like, hey, this is the situation. You helped me solve my problem, right? And that didn't really work. And so I had to kind of regroup and be like, you know what? Let's talk about this again. Um, and, and we did. And that time it was much more like, hey, this is what's going on. Um, I think I can reasonably do this. And can you help with this? And that was a much more productive conversation. So um, I think, you know, if you're in a situation where someone's not supportive, um, sometimes you just have to try again, which is hard. It's very humbling. Um, <laughs> and it's a, it's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow. Um, but yeah, and if not, I'm, I'm honestly, I don't know because I haven't experienced that yet. Hopefully we won't. Not <laughs> Definitely. So it all comes down to, of course, is, you know, it, it really could happen where at that time, um, the, the person that you, we do reach out to is maybe going, is not able to provide at that time because they might be going through something themselves, if that makes sense. So asking again at a better time could produce a better result um, from the initial. And then second to that, it's kind of like what you said, is setting those expectations, setting exactly, you know, how would we like to be supported? Um, you know, what are the ways that, you know, even if you can't match all of these, maybe you can support me in some of these, right? Okay. 
Yeah, I um, want to open this question up to the panel. Um, this is something that maybe a few of us could be guilty of, but often we do, it seems like, you know, we do want to be, in a sense, people pleasers. Uh, and, and so whenever we do say yes too many times or too often in order to just kind of like see everybody be happy, that could lead to a little bit of self-hindrance. So what are some ways that each of us could set boundaries or just even realize boundaries? Um, would anybody like to take this question? Sure, I mean, I definitely think that this is something that happens all the time in the workplace, especially virtually. I think it probably happened before in, in real life too, but um, I think honoring just, just a simple act of outlining your calendar, right? And setting aside times where you're like, this is my hour off for lunch. And this is, um, this is where I'm taking 30 minutes to go take a walk or, or various times or that are just for you or outlining times. I have to do this very often because I'm in team oriented situations. We tend to have a lot of meetings. Um, so I'll have to block off times that are for work, right? Where I'm like, no, I'm not available for meetings right now. I, I need to produce the deliverables for the next meeting. Um, and so I, I tend to rely on my calendar tool and I'm very, very deliberate about it. I usually will look even up a week ahead of time and be like, this is what I need to do. And, and, and it kind of similarly, like what Divya was describing, um, I did have, for a period of time work and go to school and I had to kind of set those boundaries with family and friends as well to say, hey, you know, I'm going to school. And so, you know, I won't be able to attend X, Y, Z, but you know, this hour that I give to you, I'm going to be devoted. There's going to be no cell phone. Like I am all about you during this time and it is your time and it's very important to me. And so, yeah, I mean, you just, that's, those are the tools that I tend to use. Yeah, it seems like right now uh, a, a good way to go about it, like you said, is just using using a calendar, being able to just be realistic with your time. Um, that way, you know, we're all able to, or we could, we could be better about not overbooking ourselves, if that makes sense, and spreading ourselves too thin. Um, Divya, would you like to add on to anything that you personally do in order to realize your boundaries so that you don't pretty much get burnt out? Um. I learned to do this recently and the only way is to respectfully say no, that you cannot do a certain thing at this particular time because I have another thing to do. And this has greatly helped me to have work-life balance where I'm not overworking. At the same time, I'm able to deliver the right things that are needed for the organization goals um, but in general I would like to suggest a book called No More a Mr. Nice Guy uh, it's a wonderful book if you want to learn how to set boundaries it's hard it's hard to say no because you might think the other person might be offended sometimes it's hard to say no to management that no I can't deliver it at this point because it seems like an unrealistic timeline, right? So I think this book really helped me. Yeah, that's amazing. It kind of seems like, you know, of course, if you do say no, um, it would help to not only just say no for the sake of saying no, but additionally, you know, provide the reason, provide the reason of why you're saying no. And then second to that is maybe we could all, right? Provide a solution. Uh, that we may not be able to do now or on the intended time, but later give a tentative date or a time where we could take care of that task, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, I know like burnout is a thing and, you know, it seems like we have fallen victim to that just by saying yes too much or just overbooking ourselves. Um, personally, kind of curious, what are some, I would call them symptoms or signals that you experience or that you've seen people experience whenever they are facing burnout or are facing uh, just kind of like the after effects of saying yes too much. What are some signals? So uh, can I answer this? Yeah. Okay. So when I say yes, that I can do uh, a a, a task A and a task B, and I can deliver both by end of the week. 
um, what I've experienced is I was not able to perform well on both A and B, or I might it might affect another task, okay? And or I might just get, get A and B done, just done for the sake of getting it done, but not it's not a very um, performance oriented or performance effective solution, a very good solution, but just getting it done. And at times it happens that I'm overworking, which will affect my personal life. Like I might have missed going for a grocery shopping or I've, I might have uh, not give my, given much, much attention to my kid or to my spouse or my partner, or I didn't attend a friend's event so it was, it actually affects both like all the areas of life. And at the same time, I did, I missed workout twice a week. So two times a week. So I think those are the burnout effects. Definitely. On um, Mary, is there anything else that you'd like to expand upon that whenever you um, feel? Well, I mean, I will say that a sign for me and anyone who knows me very well or works with me a lot is that I, I don't tend to be as patient. Like I like normally if I've had a lot of sleep and I've been well fed and I have a good, a lot of balance in my life, um, then I, I'm generally a good listener. But if I don't have those boundaries and my brain is like, I am a horrible listener and <laughs> I just don't have the, the actual patience to actually like properly listen to someone right and um and so I can get irritable and impatient and um and I think you know that's a sign for a lot of people so sometimes like when people are being irritable it's it, it's often a sign to be like hey you know maybe do you want to go take a break you know and and offer them some grace because I definitely get a lot of grace from my teammates whenever whenever I'm in those situations <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yes, uh, it that is a good symptom. So that's also something to watch out, not only amongst ourselves, but of course, as amongst our peers to make sure not only our, we don't want to ensure that only ourselves are getting burnt out, but if we do see colleagues or loved ones uh, getting burnt out as well, if they are being irritable in a sense, then we can recognize that and help them like you mentioned. Yes. Yeah, on the flip side, um, you know, sometimes we are overachieving, saying yes to this, saying yes to that. But there also comes an instance where, you know, sometimes we are scared to say yes. Sometimes we are scared to take on new challenges, right? Now, you know, fearing failure, it, it can be. It can be a big reason why a lot of people may not even want to try new things, maybe not even want to try advancing, if that makes sense. So, you know, what is some advice, Mary, that you have given to your teams or yourself to help them or yourself conquer your own fears? So I think it depends on what the fear is coming from, right? Like if it's a fear of uh, failure as far as a task that someone's unfamiliar with, um, then I think like it's just recognizing that the humanity and everyone else around us, right? Like we like to pe put people on pedestals and be like, oh, this person's a director of this. So they must be like somehow more superhuman or whatever. But really it's just, they've taken the time to learn these skills, right? And all of us can learn these skills. And so, you know, as you're learning, you're not gonna, you're going to fail. It's, it, and there's, so basically there's the only, it's either learning and failing along the way or completely failing because you fail to learn. And so it's just, you just kind of have to recognize like, all right, well, if I'm gonna do this and I've got to do it. And then if it's a situation where you're just afraid because you're, you don't want to take the risk, um, I have like a, what's the worst case scenario question that I always play out in my mind. And, um, I rely on that very heavily. So like, for example, um, when I was offered the job in Fiji, I had volunteered there pre previously, right. I'd gone there as a volunteer and then, um, reached out to the organization and they happened to be hiring at the time, but it was a temporary job. It was only paying $500 and it wasn't even sure they were going to extend the contract. Um, at the time I was living in New York, I was in love with Brooklyn, I was rising in my job. So here's this dilemma where I'm like, oh, am I going to leave this one position for a maybe, you know what I mean? And it was like, well, what's the worst case scenario? If it doesn't work out after two months, I just go home. Like, 
the world's not ending. <laughs> Things aren't falling apart. I just moved back home. Um, and so I think sometimes that can kind of help to temper that fear to be like, well, if this happens, then I can live with this consequence. And, and if you can't, then you don't make that decision. But a lot of the times we're a lot more resilient than we think and, and we can live with that consequence. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, I really like that though. What's the worst that can happen question that probably helps a lot. That could help a lot of people here as well as myself. Um, Divya, now I'm kind of curious, you know, what has been a time where you have felt scared of a new challenge or maybe if you've experienced a colleague uh, experience a little bit of fear from taking on something new, what advice have you given yourself or to one of your colleagues um, whenever that time did, did occur? Um. I think from my experience, um, when I faced the fear of failure, I still face it every time I get a new task or anything. I, But what I've learned over time is, as Mary said, um, I ask a question, where is this fear coming from? Is there a past story? Is there a root cause? Is there a negative belief? And... I try to reframe how I feel at that time, saying that it's going to be okay. But how is it going to be okay? It's just not magically going to be okay. Is one thing is to visualize all the potential outcomes that could happen when you take up a certain task and look at the worst, worst case scenarios. And when you know the worst case scenarios, also have a backup plan for, for whatever assignment you're at. And always think positive and, you know, learn from whatever happens so that you can always use that experience next time. But having a backup plan always helps. Yeah, it's amazing because I uh, know that sometimes you know, whenever we think of too many potential situations, um, that could lead to increased anxiety, if you will. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. like you mentioned. <laughs> do some nice yeah, it's good, right? Sorry to be <laughs> And I was saying, and I, uh, do some nice deep breathing when you feel mm -hmm. anxious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And reframe it, right? Because I kind of feel like if we're not feeling afraid, then we're very much comfortable and you can't be growing if you're comfortable, right? Like at least not all the time. You should be all, you should be constantly afraid, but, but you know, and so it's just like you were describing, like reframing the situation being like, wait, I'm afraid. Like this is an opportunity and getting excited about it and, and knowing that everybody is afraid sometimes, you know? Oh, hundred percent. Kind of going to use that from now on. If, um, if I'm feeling a little bit anxious or scared, it's a good thing, right? <laughs> Divya, I would like to open up this question to you. Um, kind of curious, you know, whenever any of us are starting to promote self-advocacy with the tools and advice that we have all received, mm -hmm. out of curiosity, you know, I know it might sound cliche, but what are some do's and don'ts that you would highly recommend to any of our listeners? That's a nice question. Um... So the, the main element of this uh, self-advocacy or career advocacy is being aware of yourself. First thing is that that's the most important thing because if you don't know about yourself, another person is not going to know about yourself, where you want to be, what you are, what you have accomplished. You have to be able, you should be aware and you should be able to communicate it to them. So imagine that you are uh, at your workplace or you are at a networking event uh, seeking for an opportunity. You, uh, one thing is what people do is advocate too little, saying just that uh, I want to, I'm looking for this position, some XYZ position, or uh, I'm looking for some XYZ initiatives. Uh, and maybe just one or two sentences and that's it. Because one, so the listener, whoever is listening does not have much information to support your aspiration, to offer some help, to show you some, to uh, open up some opportunities for you. So advocating too little is not going to help. So for that, to advocate in the right amount, right way, you need to first be aware of yourself. 
aware of the uh, opportunities immediately lying in front of you and advocating too much like you you're self aware you know everything you know where you want to be you know that one person is going to get you that job or that manager is going to get you that promotion and the only discussion you ever do with them is i uh, overselling yourself and not giving them space and always you know speaking up that i want to be that uh, and i did this this xyz things i delivered so many things uh, i think i'm good at it so overselling yourself advocating too much is also not good and when your mindset is based on a frustration and anger and entitlement it often you know reflects in the words you choose the body language and it will reflect a negative mindset and not a positive mindset to the listener uh, so advocating the right amount is very important and one more important thing is the two aspects again to advocating yourself one is being self aware being aware of your own self and also the second thing is being others aware means when the person the receiving end of whatever you are telling are um you know striking the right balance basically when you're communicating um like how your points are landing with the other person during a conversation so you need to be uh, aware of that as well also again listen to what the other person is telling so active listening is also important so that when you're having that communication you can al always make changes to the mid course uh, mid course conversation so that is one tip i would give and always do some pre planning um some examples always keep them in your back pocket so that when you are doing uh, when you're advocating yourself you have those tools in your in the back of your head so figure out what you need to be observing the receiving end as well it's not just you keep saying what you want to be definitely yeah um i want to open this up to the audience i know we have about 10 minutes left and we do we we would like to open up the ground for some questions that the audience may have i'm going to ask uh, one more question to the panel and so you could feel free to just type out any question that you may have for any one of us in the meantime but um i know divya you mentioned that you did recommend a book called uh, mr no more mr nice guy correct mm -hmm. yeah uh, this uh, for both divya as well as mary what other books have been impactful for promoting self advocacy for you um and then how have those books been influential in your personal development since then since reading um i think no more of mr nice guy was my recent read that was really good and uh, when i was in college i and i was transitioning to the corporate career i read the book college to career it's it's a pretty thick book but reading it slowly can really help you through that transition um if anyone from college is joining here and who's looking for a jobs pretty soon college to career is a good book um one very good uh career self reflection self awareness book is what color is your parachute uh that's a very good book uh it has a lot of uh assignments like small exercises at the end of each uh, like a chapter or something where there are some questions you can sit and journal about them um yeah that will be a really good self awareness activity um another confidence code and dare to lead are also some confidence code is another book that i think influenced uh my career largely um yeah and i listen to a lot of tedx talks related to career and everything while i'm cooking while i'm driving a lot of stuff yeah and uh 
uh, I would also like uh, everyone to know that, uh, you know, you have meetup groups in your own community, uh, in your own place where you live in. Or, and now in COVID, everything is remote. So you could even attend meetups from California and Austin. So uh, look out for your meetup groups. What areas are you interested in? They have really interesting topics, technical, non-technical and everything. So try to use those opportunities uh, to improve your knowledge. Yeah, I'm hesitant you. because I was like thinking about whether we're going to get a you know paycheck if they go buy these books. We get, we get a kickback. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was actually looking behind me because I have my books right here. You can't see them, um, but I think the success principles by Jack. Canfield um, was really helpful because it's it's kind of there's a lot of exercises to do so you're not just reading you're actually participating it's a very participatory experience where you'll read about the concept and then actually go journal and and uh, create vision boards etc and the other one I really liked was uh, the startup of you by Hoffman and has Nocha, I think it says, too far away for me to see from here. But I like that one as well. And it's it's basically, uh, it's talking about uh, treating yourself as though you were your own startup, right? And so it's a really interesting concept and it's not, it's a smaller book, um, but I like those two. There's so many more I could list, but I know you have a, probably a ton of questions waiting in the chat for us. <laughs> Definitely. Um, for anybody listening, all these books that have been recommended by the panel is in the chat. So feel free to take a look and then maybe Mary and Divya could get some commission off of those books. Yeah, yeah we win. <laughs> yeah, let's tell Jack Campbell, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and then ask uh, some questions from the audience. This one is, well, all of them are interesting. Um, this one was the first to pop up. And of course, we know that sometimes people are looking for a career change or just kind of like learning something new, as mentioned before, right? So how, how would any of us, how would you ask your current employer to help pay for an additional training outside of the current role? For example, this could be somebody that's in marketing, but would want an online course to be subsidized to be a software developer. How would you go about introducing that conversation to your current employer? That's a really good question. I think uh, finding the area of overlap um, is, is gonna be helpful, right? So thinking of ways that, okay, so if I take this class, how will I be able to take the information learned from this course and apply it to my current job? There's almost always an overlap. It could be something you know, like you, like that, what you just described, where it seems like there's not a connection, but there is one. And a lot of times, if you're willing to do either create a presentation to teach the rest of your teammates the information you've learned or figure a tie in for a project you're working on, um, then a lot of your supervisors will be willing to, to at least explore it, you know, with their management. Yeah, Divya, is there anything else that you would recommend for somebody trying to learn a new skill set within their current organization? How would you go about that situation? Uh, yeah, as Mary said, uh, explain to your management why that course will be helpful. Mm -hmm. And in case there is no overlap, like Mary's, uh, Mary has told, in case there's no overlap, explain why you want to do that career shift, role shift, and why do you think it's important at that point, and uh, what value you would bring in if that if you take that course and be uh, something else in that role. Yeah. It would probably be a good idea to get one of those journals and bring that <laughs> to the conversation whenever you go to your current employer with that. Right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. again. Again, the key is communication. Mm -hmm. Go and talk. And if if it's not approved, then it's not approved. That's not in anyone's hands, right? But the key is first to have a communication, to have a conversation about why I want that and why how it will be helpful for me and for the organization. Of course. 
Yeah, this is um, another question asked by two individuals, actually. It's basically, you know, if, if any one of us has been in environments or come from a background where we didn't speak as much, you know, sometimes back then potentially even ignored, uh, now they have transitioned into, you know, kind of in a manner where we just kind of like love speaking, that they have a lot of communication but the problem comes from how would, even though if we do like communicating now and well as, you know, sometimes just more often than others, how can we transition or how can we incorporate a habit of active listening? How can we get better at listening? Um, what are some tools, some strategies that you might suggest for somebody just trying to become a better listener? I can answer that because I'm a poor listener. And my husband often complains about it, that I'm listening to him and then I'm drawn out of that conversation. And I've been so, yeah, overthinking about other stuff, but not at the point. So how I've recently been trying to improve that is I started to listen to audiobooks and podcasts. So, and when I complete an audiobook, I try to like write down some points on how many points I actually listen and stored it. So sometimes it's like only one or two or then I started thinking about the next task I have to keep doing instead of, you know, listening. So uh, listening podcasts and audiobooks have like tremendously helped me to uh, improve my listening skills. I should say that. And another way is uh, a, so when I was in college, uh, we attend, we attend uh, lectures. So there's a constant listening happening there, like for the major portion of the day, right? And once I came to the workplace, it was not as much. And I think that also was one place where my listening skills began to be a little poor. So I started to take online classes they also help in listening skills. Yeah. yeah, those are great tips. I would just add, I think that, um, I think sometimes when someone's not listening, it's because they are either trying to remember something to come back to for a response or like a question. So I, I tend to take notes during conversations. That way, like say you're explaining something to me and I have a question 20 seconds in, I'll write down that question. That way, instead of part of my brain trying to like store that question away and then being kept away from actually like doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is listening, um, I can kind of release it. Um, and sometimes it's not a question, like admittedly, sometimes it's like I've had a long day of, of meetings and, it, and I'm thinking about making a grocery list, right? Sometimes I'll write that down. I need to make a grocery list. And just the act of doing that allows my brain to be like, okay, I don't have to store this right now. I can let that go and then do what I'm supposed to be doing right now. So for whatever reason, it works for me. And one more thing I've like, my Mary was talking, I remembered another thing is uh, listen to actually listen and not to respond. For example, Mary just said that uh, you're talking about the long day you had to your partner or your friend or your colleague and uh, immediately your part uh, your uh, the opposite person starts telling about their long day or or maybe i'm talking about i went on a vacation to hawaii and they started to tell about their hawaii vacation so <laughs> actually first acknowledge listen to them and acknowledge oh wow you had a fantastic vacation i hope you feel relaxed Give them that response first and then move into telling your experience then you know, immediately. Oh, let me respond. Yeah, that would make sense to at least, you know, provide feedback about their previous comments. That forces you, that forces any of us to actually listen rather than to think about what we're going to say next, right? And um, you're more likable when you actually listen because we all want uh, others to listen to us, right? We want people who can listen to us and who can respond in that way, but not just talking all the time. Yeah. 
And it actually helps you to advocate actually, because then you know the values of the person you're approaching, right? Like if you actually listen to the people that you interact with on a daily basis, and then you're like, oh, I need to go pitch this idea. Well, you know which, what they believe in, you know what they care about, you know what to lead with, because you've actually been listening to their conversations. So it, it just, you know, it helps you and selfishly. It helps you to be listening to them. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. We have time for one quick question and then we'll be doing the wrap up. Uh, this is going to be, do you personally consider the habits of advocating for yourself more of a self-discipline or would you consider building those habits? Um, you know, or do you have like a group of people who hold you accountable? So is it, are these, are building these habits more personal, more self-discipline related, or do you know, do you actually have, um, others that kind of do hold you to a certain standard and keep you on track. Do I lead with this one? I, I can say it's for me, it's, it's self-discipline. I mean, I, I think that people around me would notice for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, I think that um, taking care of yourself no one's going to force you to take care of yourself, right? And a lot of times they won't even notice. <laughs> so like, it, it's up to me first to be like, okay, you know what? This is my time. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to nourish myself in order to make sure I can be ready to advocate. But I don't know. Is it different for you, Divya? I, for me, I think it's a combination of both uh, being disciplined and at the same time, you know, having mentors and coaches who keep me accountable for that. And again, I have to take the initiative to be consistently approaching them. Uh, at the same time, I think it's a combination of both for me. Yeah, thank you. Well, this wraps up, you know, the Q&A as well as the panel. Uh, we do, we did go a little bit over, but let's go ahead and wrap up. Elizabeth, thank you very much for joining back. And if there's any comments that you'd like to discuss, please share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, just thank you to you and our wonderful speakers. Um, I learned so much during this session and I know so many of our attendees did as well. Thank you to IBM for hosting us again. Um, you know, we cherish this re relationship. Um, it's been always so great working with you. In the chat, I've put a million resources, um, but if you can take our post-event survey, that helps us improve each time we host a session. Also on March 30th, we'll be having our signature monthly event for March. Um, it will be um, geared around Women's History Month, so that's always a great one to join in. So you can register for that today. And uh, speakers, before you log off, I'd love to get a group photo. So if we could all just put on our Brady Bunch smiles um, <laughs> and get that um, done for a moment before we log off. And again, thank you everyone for joining. All right, one, two, three. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I hope that all of y'all have such a wonderful day. Um, if you're in a place with a cold front right now, please, please stay warm. Um, and thanks again. Thanks, Elizabeth, for this opportunity. And Mary, it was very good answering along with you. And Ben, you were a fantastic moderator. You made it more enjoyable for us and for the audience. Thank you very much. Like Divya you. said, this is <laughs> such a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> We'll definitely stay in touch. We'll keep we'll keep each other accountable. Of course. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. I'm gonna close it down. Y'all have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.